Sound check, one, two. Sound check, one, two. Okay, if I speak straight down, it comes out quite loud. If I speak out, hopefully that's coming out as a good, good volume now. So, if you just shut the door, because the glare gets me a little bit. Uh, so I'm going to set some expectations at the start of this session for, we've got a wonderful new standard coming out, C++14. Just look for a quick show of hands. Who's reasonably familiar with the C++11 standard library now? Okay. And who's been following along to see what happened for C++14? Okay, so a fair few of you have a fair idea what's coming. Um, I think I've caught all the major and most of the minor changes that went in. I've not enumerated every single defect report that we fixed, but I uh, thought I'd start with a little bit of setting expectations for how large a change we'll see between the 11 and the 14 standards. As we can see, 1998, we had the original C++ standard came out. It was a um, 17-year piece of work with 21 meetings. An awful lot of effort went into that. Then in the subsequent five years, and just 10 meetings, two meetings a year, we produced TC1, which was the update to the original standard that was mostly a bug fix and uh, clean out, tidy up the specification to be a bit clearer about what we were saying. Then we started the whole wonderful C++11 project that then took eight years, even longer than the original standard. Although the original standard did have a, a fairly complete starting, starting document from Jana's arm, thank goodness. And similar number of meetings, 21 meetings. So that was an idea of the kind of jump we can make in when we make a focused effort on doing a new standard. And then we have 2014 coming, which was just three years, just six meetings, so it's even less time than we had for doing TC1. So if you're expecting a bump on the scale of 2003 to 2011, I'm afraid you're going to be sorely disappointed. If you've set your expectations of along the same kind of scale from 98 to TC1, maybe cut back a bit because we had a few fewer meetings, I hope we will delight you. So we're somewhere between those two scales. But given we had just six meetings, I thought I could give you a, a, a quick slice of how, how the committee proceeded during this period. So first meeting we had was in the uh, middle of two, uh, summer 2011 uh, in Indiana, uh, Bloomington. Coming into this meeting, we were in a PERDA period where the main standard document is out for vote. So while the main document's under vote in ISO, you're not allowed to discuss changes to that document. Um, the rules weren't quite as strict as we thought they were back then. We've learned a little bit more about the process and the ballot completed just before our meeting. But essentially coming to that meeting, no new work can be done looking to move the standards forward because we were finally just done with shipping the old one. It was a chance to sit back, reflect, and you know, do kind of a project post-mortem on how did C++11 go? What do we want to do going forward? So of our six meetings, we're already up to the second meeting where Kona, Hawaii, um, nothing to do with the, the venue, I'm sure, but suddenly we got an awful lot of excited new people coming in because C++11 was exciting and new and it was actually doing things now. So we got a lot, of, a lot more people suddenly involved wanting to do new things again, just as we're asking the question of, well, what can we do going forward? So the essence of this second of what turned out to be six meetings was to be a planning meeting. Try and look ahead and say, what went right, what went right with the 11? What went badly with the 11? What were our expectations? And the key thing is, we definitely wanted to iterate more quickly. Eight years to produce a standard was too long. And there was a, a, a tension here between stability and moving too quickly. And a bit of discussion about what comfortable dates we'd been happy with, but the general conclusion was we'd have a minor update in the 2017 standard, and push with major updates with things like concepts finally landing in 2022. An ambitious feature for 2017 would be something like polymorphic lambdas. We weren't sure we could pull that off for 2017, but yeah, that was our, our ambitious stretch goal for that project. And in order to try and move forward on the most blatant lack was we needed many more libraries for C++11. This, it, as we looked around at the competitive landscape with other, la other languages, libraries are clearly where we're lacking. So we started spawning off lots of study groups to bring focus to bear on various areas of, of expertise and various domains, so hopefully they can start contributing larger libraries in the future. And given our schedule here, there's time for these study groups to do their work, come back with some good solid libraries that are hopefully larger libraries we can adopt and, and swallow whole. Is our goal here, and we can actually start working on some of the, the defect reports that have been queuing up since 2011. 
our third meeting in Portland, Oregon. Study groups have started convening and spontaneously doubled into numbers, so we're up to about 10 study, study groups at this point. Um, and the library and the core working groups are saying, we're resolving all these defect reports. We don't want to wait to 2017 to publish them because these fixes are important. We need to clean up the standard. But when we think of something like a technical corrigendum, as we did back for the 2003 standard, you're not allowed to add new features in one of those. And we just churn and lose too much committee time saying, is this a new feature or is this a bug fix? If it's in that small kind of a correction where maybe you're adding something in order to fix the bug, but you're adding something so it looks like a new feature. So we came up with a compromise and said, 2014 will ship a small incremental bug fix, kind of like TC1, but we'll call it a new standard so we just don't have to ask that question. And then we'll have our 2017 standard where we start docking the ambitious features like uh, polymorphic lambdas, and 2022 is still the, the big update with concepts. Then we have our fourth meeting in uh, Bristol in the UK. This meeting, we're going to have to be feature complete for shipping this standard. This is how we're going to keep control on the features because we knew the deadline was coming up immediately. And at this point, if we're going to get a 2014 standard, we have to send the first document to ISO at this point. So this is the first time we're actually looking at those larger new projects that might be coming in, saying we want to ship as part of a new standard. We have a huge influx of new people because this is our first time in Europe since the 2011 standard was published. And these are all people, again, new to the meetings, very keen to make progress and very annoyed at the staid progress of the committee up to this point. And they filled our new standard with lots of new features, which all landed and were developed in one meeting. We then sent that document out to myself about and say, is this a good thing? Can we publish, you know, can we get, get the comments back, publish the 2014 standard? So fifth meeting, we uh, basically, all we're doing now is ballot resolution. Definitely no new features going in at this point. Uh, but we've got more ballot comments that we could turn, turn around in one meeting, which unfortunately is what we had to do if we were going to publish in 2014 with our original schedule. Uh, but you'll spot in the background, even as this is all going through, we're starting to ship new PDTS documents. So file system is now going to ship as a TS around about the same time as the 2014 standard. And just to make sure we got this within the 2014 deadline, we spontaneously convened a new meeting, oddly enough, close to the Redmond area, Issaquah, um, uh, just down the road in Washington State, uh, in early February. So this was our final chance to get 2016 out. So that's roughly the schedule of work we've had. It says six meetings. Essentially, all the features were landing in just that one meeting in Bristol. So that should give us a scope by uh, how we think we're doing. Uh, in terms of if you're disappointed you're not seeing features, it's because they're out there in all those study groups set with a, a longer bar to say, we want to have larger libraries coming in, we want to do these things well, and we need time to create time and space to work on them. So if we look at what's coming in terms of study groups, we've got a lot of study groups working on a lot of interesting features. And some of these uh, study groups have already got TSs that are in process of publication, in the pr process of being um, new work items are going out to ISO for ballot. So it's going to be an exciting time in terms of libraries from a lot of features from these groups landing in the next few years. And not just li library groups, you'll spot um, SG8, I can never remember the number, Concepts, has a new TS we expect to be shipping out the first version to ISO for ballot, hopefully at the next meeting. So in general, the whole standard's moving forward, but this is a focus on libraries. So again, setting expectations, what failed to make the deadline for 14? Ought to start with what failed, but um, I don't want to lose sight of this in case people were, uh, were looking for these features. Concepts light, as I said, it didn't, clearly wasn't going to make the 2014 schedule. So it's going out as a separate TS, but there's now a reasonable chance that Concepts, which was our ambitious 2022 goal, might land in 17, if the TS goes well. There are a bunch of array extensions, one in the language, one in the library, that were in the 2014 first document we sent to ISO for ballot. But the national body comments that came back said, this isn't fully baked yet, it's not quite right. So we pulled that out, sent it into its own separate TS to keep baking and finish that work. Hopefully something along that lines will land for 17. But that part was pulled from the 2014 standard. Likewise, there was the boost optional library proposal. It was cleaned up, proposed for the standard. And there were just a few contentious design points in there that were deliberately pushed into the 14 standard to force it, the, the first document we sent to ISO to force us to answer those questions. It put us under the gun. 
This was part of the notion of lots of new people coming into the committee saying, we want you to work harder, we want you to ship more often, we're going to have you ship to ISO a document that you know you're going to get comments back on. And we got comments saying, yeah, it's not ready yet, can you take it out and finish it, please? So the main issue with optional was what to do about the relational comparison operators. If you're treating optional just as a wrapper around a type, you want to have the relational operators compare however the type itself compares. But there's a common abstraction with our wrapper types that we define all the relational operators just in terms of the less than and equality comparison operators and synthesize the others out of those. And there's a couple of varieties of places on the spectrum of how we should be synthesizing the, the relational operators for this type. And it was a sufficiently heated technical discussion with it strongly held views in various directions, and all for good reasons, that that just wasn't going to bake in this time. So that has now shipping as part of the Library Fundamentals TS didn't land in 14. And an interesting feature that if you heard the notion of trying to splice from one map offset to another because your data's all out in these list nodes, you don't want to make a copy reall and reallocate in the other node. Oh, sorry, I need to be careful about how I speak with the microphone here, otherwise we're suddenly going to have very varying pitch. But yeah, the idea of moving elements from one tree to another tree, there's no need to force those through a separate allocation, destroy, and copy. I should just be able to splice the nodes across. And we had a proposal that almost landed, but when we started working through the details, having at the meeting, we were all set to vote it in, people looked at it overnight, and then started coming up with that, but there's this corner case bug here, and it doesn't quite work like this. So we've taken that again off the table to think about it a bit more, bake it more fully. Hopefully that will come back for 17. Other thing, features, we, hope, we were hoping to remove a couple of deprecated features. Uh, the legendary um, post increment operator on bool. Why is bool incrementable, but not decrementable? Um, because it's deprecated. It sits there for whatever reason. It was planned to remove it, but someone forgot to write the paper up and submit it in time, so it didn't happen. Uh, like with the legacy stir streams, there was an active request, even in the national body comments, to say, can we finally remove these deprecated classes from the library? And the feedback was, but we don't actually have a replacement for the functionality they supply yet. String streams are different to these. These actually do solve a real problem, even if we don't like the way they solve it. So we need a replacement before we're prepared to lose a deprecated feature. So that sticks around for at least one more release. So what did we do? Um, I'm going to give a quick overview of how the language changed because one of our requests was to the core group is we don't want any language features that are going to impact the library because we have enough work trying to get new libraries in we don't want to have to re-review all the library wording, which is you know, twice as long as the core wording, for one small core feature might mean review the whole library and apply it consistently. And we kept to that fairly well. I've highlighted polymorphic lambda expressions in green, because with those we can, in a position we could probably now deprecate the whole bind library. Where with polymorphic lambdas, they have everything that we've been trying to build out of the library facility all these years. So that will hopefully to simplify the library going forward. Variable templates came in very late. We've had proposals to use them immediately in the library, but those proposals are going to happen as part of the library fundamentals rather than the, the C14 standard. Things in white clearly have no impact on the library itself. Binary, binary integer literals I have in green because this started out life as a library proposal saying we've got user defined literals, therefore I can have a user defined literal to say here's some binary data. But actually, when you looked at trying to do that from the library, it just worked much more naturally as a language feature. We have OX, we have O for octal, OB for binary, it's a, and it is at the other end of the literal, and that was just the right place for that feature to land. So this was a bit of feedback between library and core as to where should this feature design land. And the deprecated attribute, we've chosen not to use that in the library at this point, but uh, there's no reason I believe that a library vendor couldn't choose to use that there. Uh, that one is again very late coming out of the core side. Um, other features from core that mostly had no impact upon library. Uh, with generalized const expo, we could do other things, but we didn't necessarily choose to have to choose to do them at this point. But they did make a big change here that made us do what we didn't want to do, which was review the entire library for something having changed, because in this case, their change broke the library. Uh, because with a const expo function in C14, uh, you can actually mutate the states of the local variables within those functions. You can now actually have const expert functions on a class where the member itself is not declared const. Now in 11, if a function is declared const expert as a member function, it's implicitly const. And the library was written without the redundan redundancy of const expert and const. So as soon as core made this change, 
lots of library functions that were intended to be const were no longer const. So we had to do a full library review to fix that one issue. But otherwise, the core folks had kept their side of the bargain very well. We were fairly happy with that. What new parts came into the library then? A uh, very quick summary, then I'll try and go through some worked examples and show you how it all fits together. Uh, only three significant, you know, reasonable size components I'm going to say. We have shared locks, quoted strings, and a new class type called integer sequence. And even in the scale of things, these are not huge libraries in the scale of regular expressions or even the function or bind libraries, but you know, they, these are your larger pictures that have landed. We've got a host of smaller cleanups, so a, a new library function called exchange, make unique, make reverse iterator, um, See begin and R begin as free functions because that's now become a common idiom for going through containers. Uh, we have literals now for various library types that haven't landed in time for C++11. Um, something called diamond function operator, operator functors. Um, alias templates for all the type traits. A couple of other new type traits. Uh, we can now index into a tuple by the type of the element you're trying to pull out rather than having to know its numerical index. Uh, we have some more robust, error, you know, checkable algorithms now for picking up errors if you're passing two ranges. Um, heterogeneous lookup for map and set, so you don't need to convert the key every time you're doing the lookup. Um, uh, extended the hash support in the library to support enumerations. Um, size deallocation, I've just realized I forgot to write a slide on that, so I'll probably better quickly mention that now, because that was also a bone of contention. Um, when you allocate, you can provide a hint saying this is how much, you know, how much memory I need. So when I'm calling the deallocate function for my overridden new delete pair, um, it might be handy if I can supply the size as a hint there, which then means that my memory allocator that the new is implementing has moved the responsibility for tracking memory chunks and sizes back to the user rather than to the library, and there's efficiencies that can come out of that implementation. Unfortunately, it wasn't entirely ABI backwards compatible, adding this extra overload for uh, per permissive overload for the, for, the, for the delete operators. So that was an interesting feature where the, it was a problem a bit down about releasing new, new runtimes around your operating systems to cope with the fact that there was now an additional function we expected the underlying operating system effectively to be supplying that had to wait for operating, you know, our various environments to roll out and catch up with. So that's... Well, that was a contentious area, but it, it finally landed in. Um, type trait result of is now spin-eye friendly. We'll talk about that on, when we get to the slide. And finally, null iterators. Value initialized iterators now have a well-defined meaning. They're past the end iterators into a universal empty range. And final set of things we did, um, we fixed a bunch of defect reports and we sent out some new TSs. So, Running through a million miles an hour. Um, first piece of work I want to talk about is literals. And I'm going to talk a little bit about core and library here because some things were handled in core, some things were handled in library. And it's, I think, nice to see how the whole facility about dealing with new, new literals in the language has come about. So the first one I've already spoken about was binary integer literals. But um, we initially looked at them as a library feature. But the trouble is, you're, you're not creating a funky type based upon the literal. I mean, it's, it's an integer. It's you know, part of the language. It's not a user-defined type. And it, it felt odd to be having a user-defined literal for something supplied by the language. And as I say, the, uh, the idea of where you put the specifier being for the encoding for this is decimal encoded, or where there's no prefix, or hexadecimal, or octal goes on the left, whereas the suffix tells you what type it is. So putting I am binary on the right hand side felt very different and wrong compared to having a leading prefix. So this actually ended up in the core part of the language with OB and then your O1 and O1 now to represent your, you know, your binary value for that integer. Meanwhile, we, we did add some, some literals for, for types existing in the standard library. And in order to use those, of course, because they're now a library feature, these literals will only work, A, when you include the appropriate header, because otherwise you've not got that library available, and B, because these are literal functions are declared in a namespace, you have to have a using directive to expose that namespace. Otherwise, you, you can't put a, a, a namespace qualified literal. The lookup has to just find it 
via you know, effectively unqualified lookup. So we obviously didn't want to put these, these names into namespace std and force everyone to do a using namespace std. Um, we wanted to have fine-grained control so that I could just, using a very specific namespace, bring in just one of these literals because I don't want to pollute all my code and potentially have different conflicting sets of literals coming from different sources. But we also wanted to make it easy to bring in all the standard library literals without having to do the fine-grained thing if we didn't want to, without bringing the whole of namespace std in with one big using. Does, does this problem sound like it makes sense yet? So it turns out in C++11, we created the solution for this when trying to solve a completely different problem. And the solution is inline namespaces. So what we have is in, an inline namespace called literals, uh, which is inline, so inside namespace std. So if I do using namespace std, that automatically inlines using namespace literals and therefore brings in all the literals in namespace std literals. Or I could just do using namespace std colon colon literals, and now I just get the literals that come in there, and we're not going to put anything into that namespace that isn't a user-defined literal operator. And finally, we can then do again with another round of inline namespaces. Each of the um, literals actually finally lives in a namespace, um, std colon colon, string literals, chrono underscore literals, something underscore literals, so you can get just that set of literals in line through to come for you. And um, again, with the inlining at the various levels, it automatically gives you the appropriate level of cascading for the granularity of you want to bring the literals in with. Uh, I'm talking fast now because I'm nervous finding my room later. I'm hoping I'm still making some, some kind of sense. One of the interesting features we have is S is a great suffix. It says, yep, clearly I'm giving you a string. And it's also really handy to have S available to say, yeah, that's time, that's how many seconds I want. And it turns out user-defined literals have two valid syntaxes I can use to create them. I can pass them a string, and then the literal say, I'm going to pass that string to figure out what you wanted me to give, to, to, to create, or I can pass it um, an unsigned long long. So we already have effectively only two overloads available, one for strings and one for numbers which turns out to be exactly what we wanted to disambiguate the two uses we were already seeing for the S literal, S suffix. So it, it happens that it just works. So what does that look like in code? Um, first of all, we're going to include the two headers to bring in the appropriate namespaces. Using namespace std literals means I'm bringing in all the literals in the standard library that I can see through those two headers. And then we'll just uh, declare a couple of some variables. So we've got the example of doing binary, binary literals, um, the second slide, I've actually got, um, you can see I've got binary at the front, long at the end, and this funky thing in the middle I'll talk about on the next slide. Oh, a couple of slides time. And we've got hello world as a string and as a wide string. In order to get a wide string literal, you use a wide string, a string literal, literal, with the S suffix. Um, likewise, 42S will be 42 seconds as opposed to hello being a string. And we have all the traditional um, additional delineations of seconds, so MS for milliseconds, US for microseconds, they wouldn't give me my Unicode identifier here. I wanted to have mu. And the language supports it since 2011, but um, they wouldn't even give me it as an alternate token. I was very upset. Uh, NS for nanoseconds, min for minutes, not the min function because it's a different lookup rule, and H for hours. And that's essentially how literals work. Uh, the other domain that was interesting for us was complex numbers, because again, complex number literals seem to be a reasonable thing to want to, to want to include. But there's a slight problem with if I've got a floating point literal, I'll have if, and that's a keyword. Which was, so as a library group, we were scratching our heads, coming up with all sorts of ideas, maybe i underscore f, or in a mixed case, I'll throw a capital in there, or, um, Nobody bought my idea again, I did the engineering thing. J is just as good as I if I want to describe complex numbers, but we've got a room full of mathematicians, so it wasn't gonna fly. And just as we were fessing up to the main committee that you know, were punting on the, on the, uh, the complex controls, we just weren't getting a good answer. I think we had a straw man uh, proposal we were putting up in front of the full committee. David van der Voorde stands up from the back of the core committee and says, 
No, no, if you just leave no white space between the two quotes and the if, that's quote, quote, if is a single token. So you, you're not overloading the keyword. So Cor had just made a change at that meeting <laughs> that would actually mean they, they solved for us the problem of being able to use if as our uh, literal for complex numbers. So again, I said Cor did great things for us this, this, this time around, I think mostly. So that they even solved problems they didn't know we had. So in the end, this is the syntax we end up with. So auto x equals 3 plus 4i will give me a complex double. Auto x equals 3.14 plus 2.78 if will give me a complex double because 2.7 if, 2.78 if is a complex float, but I'm adding it to 3.14, which is just a regular double. And that will in turn form a complex double and complex double plus complex float will give me a complex double. So if I want a complex float out of that, it's 3.14f plus 2.78f. So just be a little careful how you're using this if you're trying to be a bit careful about you know, you're trying to get floats, or again, you can get long doubles out of here as well. But generally, I expect people will be using just the straight doubles here, and that they'll never see that issue. So um, what was I say I went through here, the idea about how we got these different granularities of namespace you can use to do the include uh, do to expose the literals. So just use the granularity you want. Final issue on literals that's purely a core feature at this point is digit separators. Okay, I'm mentioning this now because the committee burned more time in C14 on the issue of digit separators than you can imagine and probably than any other three language features combined. Everyone had an answer for this. <laughs> no two people had the same answer. There were more answers than there were people and none of them worked. Uh, my personal favorite was to use white space concatenation. I better explain what the problem is. The problem is, as we can see at the end, I've got the idea of trying to express a really large number. Really large numbers are coming up as literals more and more often in our code. And it can get quite difficult to pass out how many digits there are and where the groups are. So we just want an easier way to write these things that the human eye can pick them out. So my favorite idea was just use white space to token concatenation like we do for string literals but apparently that completely broke Objective-C++, which is an important enough language that we, even though it wasn't under our purview of the standard, it was sufficient to say we knew that version wasn't going to fly either. In the end, it turned out that the lead, a single tick token, a single quote, as long as it's not your leading character, is sufficient. it has sufficient space in the grammar to make this just work. We just have to smile and not care how ugly it is because the ability to pick out these groups, I think, is far more important than not having the feature. Well, the amount of committee time we burned on this, people were seriously suggesting it's not worth the time we're spending trying to solve the problem. But once you're overinvested in the problem, you've spent all this resource already, you're darn well going to solve the problem. And uh, we think we have. So yeah, this is in 14. So in practice, we have, this is the problem trying to say, I'm, I've got these two large numbers and I just can't see which one's larger than the other from the, easily on my eye. I thought, not easy to pick up because of the way I've chosen to align the text even if they have the same number of digits. So the idea is with the, um, this literal syntax, I can pick the groups out more easily, I can at least spot they've got the same number of digits, and I can then spot there's a digit transposition in this middle group, so I can, I've now got a scale for my idea whether x is bigger than other. Of course, it's even easier to read if I do line them up properly. Um, binary literals, as I said, showed you that earlier, the bit mask. For example, OB is our introduction, and then sequence of binary digits. Um, time, so at the top we get a string, not time. Seconds, milliseconds, na microseconds, nanoseconds, minutes, and hours. Remember to do your using namespace literals, otherwise you're not going to get them. Question at the back. Did you use that for hexadecimal notation as well? For the uh, separator units. So did we extend it to hexadecimal for the separator units? I think you'll see on the slide coming up shortly that yes we did. Good question, though. Um, sorry, I've already covered that slide. In, Another question. In STL's recent talk, he said that literals was an inline namespace, which actually meant that if you just get, said using stood, yes, it would also they would also be there. Yes, I thought I'd made that point, but I might have been running so fast that I say I, I, I'm nervous. I'm running late. I've got a little bit to get through. I'm then going to get to the end of my material and wonder why I've got ten minutes spare because I raced all the way. But I, I'm racing at the moment. 
Uh, so putting it all together, here's our example of, see on the screen, I can have my decimal expression for a gigabyte or I can write it out in hex, and I find that much easier to read at hex to know that I got that right. I can at least check the top one's a pr an even number, but that's about as far as I can go. Maybe you know your powers are two better than I do. So, another example putting it all together, using some more um, C++ 11 in this case, we'll have a raw string literal Unicode in U encoded as UTF-8. Uh, so we get to have this wonderful string all happily encoded in UTF-8. It's a raw string literal, so I don't have to separately encode the quotes. And question, is this a trigraph I see before me? When I print this string out, do I get one, quote, one, one question mark or three? Who thinks one? Who thinks three? Who's too scared to give an opinion? <laughs> We've got a good room. Nobody, nobody figured this was going to be one. If, if the trigraph expansion kicked in, that would be one string literal. And remember, trigraph expansion happens in the preprocessor before this string literal is passed as a string literal. But we did change in C++11 to say the raw string literal's got to be smart enough to go back and ask the preprocessor, what did you have before you preprocessed? Can I reconstitute any trigraphs that you already cleaned up for me and re-expand them? So yeah, the, the, the three question marks do come through. Again, using namespace literals. Or using namespace string literals. Or using namespace, any of those three syntaxes will work and make that um, string literal available to you. Final example to be seeing who's awake. What does this represent? Bingo. It's two minutes and three seconds. Deliberately designed to be misleading. And the obvious fix, we use octal. So. <laughs> octal. Yeah. Context for changes for C14. Um, C14 generalized the whole notion of context, but it was very restricted what we could do in C11. Um, and as I said, they changed the notion of library functions being implicitly const, so we had to do a fair bit of work in the library just to do a quick review. Um, Nikola Yusutis, who you might know is the author of you know, the, the most prominent book of the, about the standard C library, did a valuable work for us here, and he did the line by line review of the library and came up with a paper that fixed this problem. And there was the other design question now should we mark more functions const expert? Um, one of the big design discussions that I don't have a, uh, a slide on that came up during this meeting is do the library vendors have freedom to add const expo where the library does not specify it yet? And this is a big question. Um, I finally came up with some code built around Sphinx that would demonstrate that it was observable whether or not a function was declared const expo. So at that point, it's a real issue. Can we have you know, different ABIs you know, where people are producing different template instantiations because whether or not it was const expo or not will produce just different manglings now. Uh, so we had a big, big debate and we did the usual you know, five-way poll to say, you know, do, do we think library vendors have this freedom today? And the poll was, you know, 66666, six, 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 but how strongly they felt whether we had it or not. So we hadn't got a clue. And I also came up with a second poll of, well, we spent a long time discussing this, and we still want some clear for an answer. Is this an important issue that we still need to keep talking about? And six, 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 six. It's the closest, me most meaningless vote result I've ever seen out of the committee. And um, it was my problem to solve that then. But it turned out that, as a basis of that meeting, most of the library vendors essentially agreed they, did, they themselves didn't think they had this permission. So they just sent us word to the library to say, if we don't think we've got it, we're not going to use it. Let's make it clear in the standard that library vendors do not have the freedom to add const expert to a standard library function unless the standard has already put it there. And we're aware, looking forward into the future, that adding const expert is potentially an ABI breaking change, which is a concern that people might therefore have to say, we don't, we don't want to make that change going forward. So that's where we are in the design space. So it, here's an example of something that, a problem we're facing in C++11 that we then comes, it feeds into where should we use const expo in 14. Got this wonderful function called strlen. Here's a fairly naive implementation of strlen on the screen, and we can't make it const expo because it's mutating data within the function, and it's got two separate return paths. So for two reasons, this can't be a const expo function in C++11. What we can do is we can write it this way in C++11, which will now solve the problem of making my function const expert if that's a real problem. 
But my implementation of Sterling is now a recursive function call, which might not be the ideal way to implement a high performance function like Sterling. So, one possible solution. I like the idea of being able to compile time compute the length of my string still. So I do an overload, Sterling underscore C, that's going to do the crazy compile time thing, and I will use this only in context per context. And that way I can then have both solutions. But remember, this was our ideal form, and with the core language changes, this is now available to us. So should we make Sterling const expert for C++14? Who thinks yes? A few people actually like to do compile time strings. Who thinks no, we shouldn't make Sterling const expert for C++14? I'm seeing only one vote in favor. So gen generally, most people are either not following or don't particularly care about Sterling. But though it, it, any consensus, it was towards making it con const expert. We chose not to for a very important reason. Sterling is typically implemented as a compiler intrinsic and not actually as the function that you saw rendered because the function you saw rendered will be too slow compared to really going down to native code when you know how to do that well. And const expert compiler intrinsics was not something we wanted to get into. That's pushing far too much onto the implementation of the compilers, especially as it's not mandated which of these functions are actually going to be intrinsics. That's just compilers going out of their way to help you out. But it was deeply important optimization. So we did not add um, const expert to these functions that we thought were actually very important compiler primitives. We did add const expert in a few places. I suggest you follow the links on the slide after the presentation. Um, complex numbers got const expert on their constructors and all their operators. Uh, chrono, similar kind of deal. Uh, const expert library to the containers paper turns out tuple and array with the two containers. I'm not even sure tuple's a container. And uh, an array's a kind of funny container. But we, a few const experts applied there. And likewise, um, in the utilities clause, forward move and the pair comparison operators were the important places we found that const expo was missing. Moving on to our next problem. How am I doing on time? I think I've, I, I say I've got 25 minutes. Does that sound right? Okay. Example, I've just tried to stream some code. So I'm going to auto in equals hello world string literal. So we now know that in is standard string. I'm going to create a string stream and write my string to the stream. I now want to read out something of the same type. Unfortunately, decal type of in because I used auto, so I don't know now that it's a standard string. I'm just being a bit funky. Perhaps I'm being a bit showing off about using the 14 syntax for no other reason than it was available. And I now stream back out my string and write it out. What do we write out? So I want to tell me what, what string is going to be written at this point. Uh, it's just hello because when I stream back, I, I pass as far as the space, and that, I've now consumed the token I was going to stream in. What we can do with C++14, um, sorry, uh, am I a slide ahead or behind myself? Okay, I had an extra slide in, yes. This is what we do in C++14. We've got a new function called quoted that came straight out of Boost, um, designed to solve this problem. If I stream out a quoted in and read back a quoted in, it will round trip strings with white space. So I then get back the string hello world that I wanted in the first place. So the key thing to bear in mind about this is it's not designed for displaying those strings to the human users because we're going to encode and you know, put escape characters around our quotes and things. Uh, on the other hand, it does allow the round trip reading and writing of strings, which is its purpose. Um, we also have fun functions within the API, I don't have slides showing these, so you can actually pick your escape characters to say how to escape the, uh, the various symbols. So you may be passing some externalized um, CSV file that uses slightly different tokenization. You can probably match that up with the extension points we have in there. But the default is we use quotes to escape, and we escape them with a backslash. Next proposal, Diamond Functors, was a sterling piece of work from Stefan LaHoyev at Microsoft. Uh, I think this might have been his original proposal to the standard committee uh, that you might have heard about last night was it just came in as a slam dunk. He'd done so much homework on this and written the paper exactly right. It didn't even go through any edits at the meeting. It just went straight from the, the paper that was in the pre-meeting mailing as his first paper straight into the standard. I've never seen the like before. So it's very nice to have people like that coming up and joining the committee now. But the problem we're trying to solve is something like this. 
I've got a, a map key value and I want to, I mean, it's not a big problem, but it, it's an annoyance. I, I want to reverse order the maps. I'm using greater rather than less as the key. And I've now got to repeat the key there just because all our standard functors have these, na have these additional parameters. What I would probably rather have is something like a struct greater here that has a template comparison, template function called overload operator that will do the right thing. And then I don't need to name the type parameters, I could just use greater. The problem is, of course, the library has already taken the word greater. So Stefan did what any good library designer does at this point, he hunted around trying to find good alternate terms we could use for every single one of the standard operators in the language. And his ultimate conclusion was, it's not possible. The library's already stolen all the good names. But Stefan's a devious little guy. Came up with this wonderful little hack. This is an evil genius at work. And yeah, I'm not sure how much evil genius we want in the C++ standard, but it, this is kind of neat. We do know that we can't compare, the one thing you can't instantiate greater on is void. It makes no sense to have it because you can't pass them as the, the type parameters to the function. Therefore, we'll create a specialization for void. But if we happen to be able to instantiate greater void, and that will actually do what we want it to do because we know this is actually a, a spare point in the design space at the moment. And then when we go back, when we declare our primary template for greater, thank you, um, we'll give it a default template parameter to void. So if we say nothing, we now get, by default, the, the, our preferred behavior. So if we want uh, to be able to have our map now without repeating the key type name, we have greater diamond, hence the name the diamond operator. We couldn't unfortunately lose out. You're calling it the default specialization. I still need to use the pair of angle brackets. But this can you know, simplify a whole, a whole bunch of things for you. Just clean up of the, of the library interface. Next thing we're doing with the, uh, with the associative containers. Uh, got this problem, I've got a map of string and int and I find for my string literal, because my literal here is a const char star, I now have to go off and construct a standard string object and I'll probably get a small string optimization for something the size of literal, but in general this could be going off and hitting me memory allocating more objects just to go off and do the lookup to find out whether the string I asked for is in the container or not yet. And de depending on your workload, that may or may not be actually a, a really serious problem. It's, it was enough of a problem that was worth trying to solve. What we really want to do is have find take a template parameter and deduce from what you give it and say if, if the type I'm comparing with can compare with that type, I don't need to do any conversions and construct any temporary objects. Only the temporaries entirely. So we do that and we actually end up with even more temporaries because every time we do the comparison, we're now potentially constructing the string because we're still by default using standard less of string, and standard less of string still has a string on both sides. So we end up with yet another customization point, which we call the is transparent support. We have a type def member of your class, of your functor that says is transparent. It says, yeah, I can compare with things that are not strictly my type. Please don't go making temporaries for me. Forward me through, you, you can forward me through properly. Otherwise, you probably want an algorithm where you make your own temporary up front so you make no more than one temporary before we do all the comparisons. And as I say, st standard less doesn't have this property by default, but standard less diamond does. So if you want to use these new heterogeneous lookups in the standard library, they're available to you, they're a part of the C14 interface, but you're not going to get them by default unless you use the diamond operators. So your default comparator for map and set unfortunately will not give this. We can only do so much without breaking existing code. Question. Uh, I don't think we do this for unordered map. I'm trying to think why. Um, because in terms of hash, I'm going to have to hash 
whatever you give me. And I really want to hash as the same type of, as my key is using rather than hash whatever you gave me that's using a different hash algorithm. So that's not a good start. Right. Then we've then we've got the quality comparator function where it could probably work, but it's too late because we've already had to pay the extra cost of doing the hash. I hope, but we don't give that guarantee. <laughs> but, I mean, this is the point where the performance guarantee is gained. Like, this comes yeah. out wrong. And not in the case of the match, but yeah. very much in the case of the like, just hash. So, yeah, that room for improvement, but we, we got the basic work out the door. And again, this is transparent thing was quite a late-breaking discovery. We, we put the first implementation out and went, why isn't it working? <laughs> like, oh! <laughs> no substitute for experience with the shipping product. Uh, <laughs> trace extensions. We have two, two whole new type traits. Count them, two. Um, is null putter. Probably not the world's most useful type trait, but we wanted to complete our set of, you can diagnose what kind of category of type do I have, and null putter is a category all on its own. So we've still exposed compile time reflection, diagnosing whatever, whatever type is. And it's final, turns out to be a really important property if you're trying to use the empty base optimization. Now that we can mark classes as final, so you can't derive from them, it's really hard to figure out if that base class that I want to potentially use the empty base optimization on is final, so I can't derive from it and can't apply the empty base optimization. But, so we added the trait that will do that, and in, in order to, I can't remember whether this shows up, whether it's final is true for unions as well, so I check only one trait, or whether I still have to check is it final or is it a union. I think just the one trait gets us there. Uh, in addition, Walter Brown gave us alias traits. Uh, so, uh, it's a, you can see the full implementation of one of these traits on the screen, um, using add const underscore t is type name add const t colon colon type. It doesn't maybe look that fantastic, but you'll see in practice actually greatly reduces some of the verbiage you have to type when you're expressing these things. You'll see on the next slide. Um, final one we've got them is result hub has now become SFINI friendly. What this means is in C++11 we had generalized SFINI, so that if, if code fails to compile, you hit trigger the SFINI condition. So I go off in my example where I'm just then the result is type name result of function colon colon type. And if I don't find colon colon type, SFINI kicks in and fabulous. Um, my, my function drops out of the overload set because I can't do a result of on that particular expression. But we don't say what happens if I can't form that expression. So a good library implementation will make sure that goes to a, a valid empty result of template instantiation that doesn't have a type member. But it's quite viable to simply not have a template instantiation there or have a template instantiation that tries to figure out type and that in turn fails to compile. And when that second lookup fails to compile, because we said type is there, we say, okay, I found it. And then when I try and use it, I then get a compilation failure because we don't want the compilers to perform, I've tried what the, uh, the core folks called it, but compilation, compilation, you know, Con con speculative compilation just to find out whether code is valid or not. So they just have one level of compilation to see, does that give me a context that succeeds or fails or not? So simply as a quality of implementation, we now mandate that in all cases, the library has to make sure the, a result of that fails, fails in a spinai friendly manner. It's, it's a minor thing for cleanup, but when you start writing lots of template metaprograms, these things can, you know, end up mattering quite a bit and help a lot. Um, for the fundamentals TS, we were proposing to do the same thing for common type and iterated traits when you go querying those for their nested types. But it turned out when we pulled the room that all, all the vendors who were, all, all main library vendors were present and all but one of them were already doing this. And the one that wasn't doing it was planning to ship it within the next six months. So at which point we said, we don't need to put this into a TS. All we're doing is giving a quality implementation guarantee for users. We can tell them they've got that already because they do. We'd miss 14, but common type and iterative traits will land the same guarantee in C17. Be the first defect report we fix as, as we get to the next meeting. But as I was talking about the kind of cleanup you get from the underscore T type uh, trait, result of T. As you can see, rather than having this type name and colon colon type, A, I don't get those silly compiler things about missing the type name keyword. It's just shorter and neater and easier. 
it would be really nice if we didn't have the underscore t and the underscore t applied to the original type trait. That ship sailed back in 2011, and potentially earlier when we did library TR1. That, that's what we got for clearance with the trait. Hmm, I call this one a trait as well, am I? Uh, next one, we have a new trait called integer sequence. This is one I, I've shown you the quoted strings. This was a, a second of my three things on the, the big bullet slides at the front, so your big bullets, I'm afraid, aren't that exciting. But I'm trying to write a function like this. Um, I'm going to call a function, I'm going to pass, here's the function I want you to call, and I've captured the arguments into a tuple. So I want to unpack the tuple and forward the tuple element to that function call. And how do I implement that? This is, it, it's a problem that's soluble with C++11, but it's a, it's a pain to get your head around if you've not tried solving this problem yet already. You'll notice I'm already relying on the deduce return type of C++14 because I don't want to figure out what the return type is, just do the return the call and the compiler can figure that out for me. So I'm solving half the problem straight up. And what I'm going to want to do is call something like this, this call impl. Well, I'm going to have the function coming in deduced, um, a parameter pack that will match whatever's in the tuple, and I'm going to need to index through that. So I'm going to have a pack of size t's of the same length as the args, so I can then call function with get index args, pack expansion, and probably using some standard forwards and other things around there, but you, you get the gist. But how do I know how to pass the pack of the right, you know, how do I generate the size t parameter pack? I can know how big the, um, I, I know the size type, know how big my tuple is, but I don't know how to, generate a pack expansion there that I can drop in and somehow did, did use and call. And that's what uh, integer sequence gives us in C++11. Integer sequence is a type that will be parameterized on that kind of a parameter pack. And we therefore have a couple of functions that we can use to generate and pass that through. So make index sequence of size of the parameter pack. I pass that through in the manner of a tag dispatch, which gives me the ability to deduce a parameter pack of exactly the right size, because that matches the parameter pack of the integer sequence I created with the make integer sequence call. So now I have the parameter pack injected into the, the template parameter list, I can just do the function forward very easily. The bit of the magic is figuring out how to write this make index sequence, and that's why we put it into the standard library. Having said all that, we actually didn't put this simple forwarding function into the standard library. We gave you exactly this code pretty much as an example, but we left it as an example rather than normative. So that's, again, the other thing that's going to share, I hope, as soon as C++17 opens, we're going to turn this example actually into a normative part of the library. But you, you, you'll be waiting another release for that. Index a tuple by um, type. Just to see where I am in terms of slides and time. I'm getting close, both ways. Um, get int from make tuple, I've got three parameters, exactly one of them is an int, so it's going to figure out which of those parameters is an int for me and return 42. Second example, get float. I don't have a float from that make tuple. I get a double, but a double is not a float, so that's going to fail to compile. Third example, make tuple 13, 42 in string. I now have ambiguous, I'm two ints. So when I try and get an int out, it's ambiguous, it's not going to compile. But the final example says, just because I'm ambiguous for int, I can still get the string, because string is not ambiguous in this case, so the ambiguity on the other elements does not affect my ability to pull out a string and have the compiler figure out the index for me. A new function into the standard library. Exchange is kind of like a swap that returns, you know, returns the old value, sets the new. Um, basically named after the atomic library's equivalent function doing the same. This is going to enable us to drop the post increment operator on, on bool and have people who were relying on it have something really easy they can call instead. Um, make unique will give us a unique pointer in a similar manner to make shared. And the hash functor is now specialized to support en enumerations as well as other kinds of events. And it will, be, it will hash as the underlying type of the enumeration because we can get that underlying type from a type trait already. Iterator related enhancements. I already mentioned that uh, a value initialized, which is effectively default constructed, but constructed and not left as uninitialized if you've got a pointer or something similar, 
a pair of those will always denote an empty range. So you can actually use them in more manners than just as if they were a singular iterator. But again, they're to a distinct empty range. It doesn't mean you can compare them with any other container iterator. Uh, C begin, R begin, and C R begin as three functions. So you can use those in a similar manner that the uh, new for loop uses. Make reverse iterator will get turn a, a, a bi directional or better iterator into a reverse iterator of the same kind with the, 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 the iterator you supply as the under, fundamental initial underlying iterator. And for algorithms like standard equal that take two ranges, but for the second range, we would supply only the first input iterator. And say, so, yeah, you, you know that it's going to be large enough. We actually have the ability to call them now with two iterators for the second range as well. So we avoid security problems of accidentally overflowing the ranges. We have a good semantic if the second range is not as long as the first range. We can give, catch that and give you well-defined behavior. So this simplifies a, bit, a number of use cases quite a bit. Quite a nice feature to have. As I just lots of cleanup. Um, I have a couple of slides on shared locking. These are probably my last two slides. I'm going to put the code on the screen. I am not a threads expert, and the speed I'm going through now, I will give it you all wrong. I basically copied the code out of Howard Hinton's paper that explains what this is doing. But yeah, this, this is the key part we added to the concurrency part of the standard. So the idea is reader writer locks, but Howard gave us a good reader writer locks proposal, and the committee threw half of it away, saying it was too big, too complex. So we ended up with some notion of shared locks, uh, which again went some, through some naming variations. So we ended up with a shared time mutex, and a shared lock as a way to acquire it. And if we look at the second slide, you can see that um, I had another something to point out on here. What was I pointing at? Shared lock, shared time mutex. I, my, my mind deserts me just as I get to the end of the session. Last slide. Yeah. Controversial issues that we, we visited as we went through C++11 that have not necessarily been resolved yet. Standard future, uh, the destructor can block, but only in certain contexts. If only, specifically, only if it's returned as a result of calling standard async. And there were all sorts of attempts to try to solve this, but the general solution consensus was that ship has sailed. We can't fix it without breaking the existing compiling code. We have to live with it. Maybe, maybe we can have an async too that does the right thing, but it's still not clear how we're going to solve that problem. Um, the size delete, as I said earlier, has problems with we've got to wait for runtimes to, to catch up. Uh, no longer implying const with const expo. We've had to fix throughout the library, but that's going to be potentially a problem for users' code as well. And the array stuff we defer to a separate TS. And with that, I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> Question? Uh, maybe two by two quick and I blink. Yeah, I'm, quite I'm, possible. <laughs> I'm, I'm string literals. Yeah. So when I'm saying auto uh, s equals string literals, mm -hmm. Saving there is the constructor call. Um, you're, you're getting it, it, it is a constructor call essentially. It's a function that's going to. So auto c equals auto. Yeah. S. Okay. So why is that better without the s? If I'm using a string literal for whatever reason, some people you know they, they like the string literal syntax and it annoyed them this is a C style const char style, whereas they actually want a standard string. It's a convenience. It's not necessarily a better way to do things. Oh, oh, okay, so if I put string C. Yeah, it would have the same effect. So, oh, 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 oh. Yes. So. So the question is, can we overload on const expo? And the answer is no. Uh, before const expo came into the language, David van der Voorde had an interesting proposal called metacode, which let us do a lot more interesting things at compile time with the language. And one of the key features he had was overloading on being a literal, which would effectively be the same notion as overloading on const expo. But that, that feature didn't go anywhere, and there's been no similar proposal since. Any other questions? In that case, I'm going to let you go get your refreshments. Thank you very much.